Hi, good afternoon everyone, I'm Anna, um, and it is my pleasure to introduce author, foreign policy strategist, and former diplomat, Ms. Farah Pandith. A pioneer and leader in the field of countering violent extremism, Ms. Pandith is a frequent media commentator, as well as author of the book, How We Win, How Cutting Edge Entrepreneurs, Political Visionaries, Enlightened Business Leaders, and Social Media Mavens Can de Defeat the Extremist Threat. She has worked as a political appointee under Presidents George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. More recently, she served as the first ever special representative to Muslim communities, serving under two secretaries of state, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. In this role, she traveled to nearly 100 countries, engaging with Muslim communities worldwide and launching youth-focused initiatives. In 2013, she was awarded the Secretary's Distinguished Honor Award for her work. She has also served in various senior roles in the U.S. Department of State, the National Security Council, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. Additionally, she served as the chair of the task force on countering violent extremisms within the Department of Homeland Security's Advisory Council. Currently, she is a senior fellow with the Future of Diplomacy Project at Harvard Kennedy School, as well as an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Today, she will be speaking to us about diplomacy, defeating extremism, and the role of soft power. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ms. Farah Panda. Thank you so much, Anna. You did a really nice job. You did a really nice job. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good. Okay, there was a really important part of my bio you guys didn't get. I went to Smith. <laughs> That's the most important part. Um, and I say that with sincerity, because um, I happen to know a little bit about the power of women's colleges. And I happen to know a little bit about what you're experiencing um, in your daily life on this incredible campus. I have great respect for Wellesley. It's an amazing school. I feel so honored to be back here. Let me tell you what I did at 7 o'clock this morning. I took a picture of that amazing lake uh, out there and sent it to one of my closest friends who was a class of 1990, uh, Wellesley alum, um, and told her what a gift it was to start my new year uh, here on this on your campus so I feel really privileged to be here um, I'm also really privileged because um, that great lady Secretary Albright um, was a role model for me I hope that she is for you um, dynamic amazing woman who um, who tells us all what's possible actually and uh, and you're very lucky uh, to have uh, many people like her uh, as part of your alumna uh, and I hope that you will look to them to inspire you and to help you build lives that tell you what is possible. But I hope that their lives are not the end of the story, that you understand how powerful it is for you to think even bigger than they did about what is needed and what we must do in the world today. What I want to do today during our time together is have a conversation with you about diplomacy and soft power and fighting extremism. But I also want to talk to you about what it means to be a woman on this planet in the 21st century when the world is falling apart and <laughs> we need to do something about it. OK? Um, we cannot sit back. We cannot let others do things for us. You all know that. You hear that in all your classes. But I hope that as you think about some of the themes that we'll talk about today, you'll ask me questions about my own life, about your own life, about what you want to do, how you want to impact things, where you come from, why you think a particular way, and what you think people aren't thinking about which is a really important aspect to all of this. You cannot sit back and let others define for all, all of us what the most important questions are for the 21st century. Um, it's not something that you, you are, you are um, taught in any of your classes, whether you're a math major or you're a philosophy major. It's something that's in the ethos, ethos of this place. You picked the school for a reason. You're here for a reason, and I believe very powerfully that uh, the women that come out of schools like this have a unique role to play in the conversations um, that we are having both on a domestic, uh, <laughs> domestic scale and also on an international scale. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the things that I have worked on, um, and then we'll get to some of who I am and what I've done. But I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I have heard that this is an unbelievably selective process to become a scholar here. So kudos to all of you um, for being part of this incredible group. But I also understand that not all of you are the same in terms of like you're not all English majors, you're not all French majors or something, that there are a lot of disciplines in this room. So forgive me for those of you who are government majors and already know this stuff, but let's just make sure that we're all speaking the same language. Somebody tell me what hard power is. What is hard power? You've heard the term? People have heard the term hard power? What is hard power? There are no right or wrong. Just, yeah, please. Military, money, 
Um, it's like the measurable resources that a country can have. Uh, it's hard for me to talk about hard power without talking about soft power, though. So. We're getting to that. Yeah, well, <coughs> We're getting to that. So hard power is that when we think about power, um, a country's power, how it wields it, we generally think about um, the use of military or the use of things that make, um, make us uh, push another country in a particular direction. Um, and you're right, um, economic uh, force, military force, um, that's hard power. That's something that we are unfortunately watching on our phones every moment of every day. That's usually what people talk about when they think about a country's power. <coughs> But we also have heard the term soft power, right? Um, what is soft power? And is that something that only governments use? What is soft power? Yes, please. It's more relational. It kind of refers to um, relationships between governments and uh, it's a bit more incentive-based. Incentive-based. So you're trying to push somebody in a direction that you want them to go by doing what? Them what they want. Influencing them, pushing them softly in a direction. What are you used? What are your tools? What are soft power tools? How do you do that? Social media, music, I you know, like Curry was promoting KDB as soft power. Like, it could be anything like that, like a cultural something that people want. Something that people want. You've got to know what you want to, how you want to push things. Excellent. Um, are countries the only entities that use soft power? Who else uses soft power? I think a really good example of soft power is a traditionally like patriarchal families where the mother relies on her soft power to get the father to like approve on some things that she wants to get done, like maybe <coughs> make him a nice meal, really, really nice meal, give him a nice massage so that he can let your children maybe take this class that you want them to, something like that. Excellent example. It is understanding your audience it's knowing what you have to do to be able to get that person to do what you want them to do without actually pushing them to go do it, right? So yeah, cooking them a great meal, <laughs> um, using art, using culture, using social media, um, using all the tools in our toolbox that include everything that you experience every day. And soft power isn't something that just obviously governments use. It's something that businesses use also. It's, it's, it's what brands use to get you to buy um, that pair of jeans at, at Zara or that you know, shade of lipstick at Sephora. It's, it's what you do to push somebody in a particular direction. You could call it marketing and advertising, but that's not everything. It is the carrots that you're using. You've heard of the term sticks and carrots, the carrots that you use to be able to do things. Now, when we talk about hard and soft power, it's, it's a, there are terms that were coined by Joseph Nye, as you should know this, uh, at the Kennedy School. He's written awesome books on hard and soft power that I really highly recommend. But um, you've also perhaps, for those of you who are government majors maybe, um, also heard adapt uh, adaptations, I can't speak today, um, on power. So you've heard smart power, you've heard other forms of power, which is sort of taking a little bit of this and taking a little bit of that and, and moving it together so that we can actually get somebody to do something. All of these things are important for us to think about as we think about world affairs, as we think about how to uh, navigate through the daily life of making decisions around around foreign policy, which is the field that I have spent the majority of my life in. Um, now, when I think about hard and soft power and I think about the U United States, which is, um, which is where I worked at the Department of State and, and at, the, at the White House, um, I wasn't uh, involved in hard power. I, I didn't really focus my attention on that. I focused my attention on soft power because I had to figure out ways to be able to use non hard power tactics to be able to get what we needed to get done. And, um, and the art of doing that, some of the soft power navigation at the State Department is under the big umbrella of what? Diplomacy, right? What is diplomacy? What is diplomacy? What's a diplomat? What, is it, what does it mean to be a diplomat? What is, what is diplomacy? How you, yes. Person that represents a country, yes. keeping in mind the interests of the country and trying to build relationships with other nations uh, to achieve a certain purpose. Yes, really well done. What's your major? International. Aha, <laughs> knew it. Um, so you did that really well. Um, so 
So when we think about what a diplomat is or what we think about the, the way in which we use diplomacy, obviously the Albright Institute is named after somebody who is like a premier diplomat. But the art of diplomacy, the ability to work with your colleagues in other countries and even within your own Department of State to be able to figure out solutions to problems is all under in, in sort of the bucket of soft power. Why am I spending time on all of this? Because I want you to understand that um, a little bit about sort of how I got thrown into working on soft power and diplomacy during my <laughs> career on a very important aspect um, in a post 9-11 world. Um, I, was, uh, I was working um, in the private sector uh, when 9-11 happened. And I was in the Boston actually. And uh, I remember that day very clearly. Uh, it was, it, it, you know, as we all, all do uh, nearly 20 years ago. But I, I was on the 41st floor, floor of a building that overlooked Logan Airport. And um, when we were just getting the information in, and remember that social media was not what it is today, we were getting bits and uh, pieces of this information. I remember looking out on a perfect September morning at Logan Airport and thinking to myself, oh my god, um, we don't know what happened. But I remember this sort of sinking feeling um, in the pit of my stomach. And I kept thinking, oh my god, if this has something to do with Muslims or something to do with Islam, I really, I really hope it, it doesn't have anything to do with that. And as we found out in the days um, afterwards, this terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda, was claiming responsibility for this horrific attack uh, on the World Trade Center and obviously in, in Pennsylvania and, and the Pentagon. And they were using the name of Islam for their nefarious ends. Now, I'm an American. Uh, I'm a Muslim. I was born in northern India. I came to the Boston area when I was a baby. I grew up here, Massachusetts is home. Um, and I remember feeling this sense of doom and dread because I knew the impact that this was going to have um, around the world. I could never have imagined, and I promise you that nobody, nobody could ever have imagined what the last, the last 20 years would have been like. Um, we couldn't have predicted it. There were no models in the CIA that were designed for this kind of attack. There was no analysis structure that could have told us what was going to happen to the idea around being Muslim on planet Earth in a post-9-11 world. Um, but what happened to me was that I felt very strongly that as an American and as a Muslim that I couldn't sit back and not be a public servant. I wanted to serve my country. And so I was very fortunate to be able to come back into government um, because I wanted to push back against this idea that Al Qaeda was trying to define my country, America, trying to define my religion, Islam. And I was really eager to make sure that we were putting new narratives into the into the system so that we were not letting them get the megaphone for what it meant. When all of this was happening, and 9-11, the aftermath of 9-11, we were using hard power primarily to be able to figure out how to defend ourselves. We sent troops, we, you guys know all this history. We were doing all of this stuff from the hard power perspective, making sure that a guy named Osama bin Laden did not have the capacity to be able to do this again, and that we were protected as the United States and that other countries, our allies, were protected as well. It took us a little bit of time to get to a place where we were asking questions that were not just hard power questions, they were soft power questions, which were, how did those guys get radicalized? What was it that made them think that they needed to do this? And what is this ideology of Al Qaeda? What are they putting out there? And how do we stop it? Those are really important questions to ask, but it's even more important to think about as a strategist and as a diplomat, what the heck can we do about it? How can we prevent another person from, from, finding, from not finding that ideology appealing? That idea, the concept of the war of ideas, is the, the flexibility that I have been um, working on since 9-11, since this idea of us versus them. I hate to be able to tell you that in 2020, we were not just dealing with groups like Al-Qaeda, where now we couldn't have even imagined that there would be something called the so-called Islamic State, or that a Boko Haram, or a Al-Shabaab, and now and neo-Nazis, and identitarians, and let me just add all, all of the other us versus them ideologies. We could not have imagined all of that. But for you to understand this idea of extremism, and defeating extremism meant that we, as the US government, had to think very carefully about how we use soft power and what we could do to prevent the next generation of young people from finding this appealing. I'm going to put the brakes on for a moment. This is not 
This is not an effort to win hearts and minds. Okay? This is not me, the United States, trying to persuade you to like everything that we like. That is not what this is. This is us saying, you 17-year-old kid, what can we be doing to make sure that Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Boko, whoever, doesn't get to you before we do so that you can reject the us versus them ideology? So make sure that as you understand what it is we're doing, you understand that the tools in our soft power toolbox on <coughs> ideology were all around one very specific thing, identity. What does it mean for a young person to think about themselves and who they are? How do we navigate as a government to help a young person with their identity? Now let's all get serious for a moment. It doesn't matter what religion you are, what gender you are, anything. When you're a young person and you're growing up, everybody is asking questions about who you are. I mean, come on, let's get real. What's the purpose of life? What am I supposed to do? I mean, it doesn't matter. But when you are growing up post 9-11 and you are a Muslim and all day, every day, 24-7, offline and online, people are telling you what it means to be Muslim and those voices are coming from the bad side, it is a very dangerous proposition. And the US government understood that. So the work that I've done since 9-11 has been in the space that I've just described. How do you stop a young Muslim kid from finding this ideology appealing? That is countering violent extremism, or CVE. Okay, now has anybody heard of the term CVE? Yes? A couple of people are not in their heads. This is not policing. This is not drones. This is not super secret like things happening. This is a young person getting counter narratives to the narrative of the extremists so that they say, I do not want to be part of Shabab. I do not want to be part of Boko. I don't want to be part of the Taliban. Okay. <coughs> and CVE is also now, unfortunately, I don't want to be a neo Nazi. I don't want to be part of the Ku Klux Klan. I don't want to be part of the identitarians. All of these us versus them ideologies are what CVE is all about. And the way to be able to do this, the solution here, is soft power from the grassroots. It's getting a young person to understand from a credible voice, from their own peer group, that they don't want to join the dark side. Okay, how do you do that? You do that through, through some of the tactics that you just described. You use social media, you use art, you use culture, you use poetry, you use hip hop, you use everything that you possibly can to get a young person to say, I buy into somebody that I believe in who says, I don't wanna be part of all of that. So as we, have, as we have thought through this whole soft power piece as diplomats and using diplomacy, it has been an interesting journey for me personally um, as somebody who was at the, at the policy table when we first began to think about how to do this. And what I want to do um, is to talk a little bit about, I want to engage with you on this, on what it means to be a female diplomat in the context of all of this when the people around that table are mostly men, first of all. And second of all, hard power is so easy because hard power is so measurable. It is easy to tell you how many people were killed, how many planes went off, how many troops are on the ground, how many submarines you're gonna use. It is much harder to be able to say, because we did the program that was engaging the young person and offered them other solutions, they didn't become radicalized. It's so much harder to measure that. How do you convince people around a table who want the hard power solutions to be the ones who say, I want to listen to what you have to say. You can convince me. How do you do that? Has anybody ever been in a situation where you're the only voice around the table, for example, who has an alternative method to be able to do something? What's it been like? Has it been easy? Give me somebody. Give me an example of a of an issue that you've worked on. Your your. I don't. It doesn't have to be extremism, obviously, but it can be something that you are. One, everybody wants to go one way, and you you decide you want to go. Yes. Well, I have a general example. I found it difficult to um, to say that I to deny the other person's um, point because when when I did that, it, it was it was even more difficult for me to to say what I was actually trying to propose. 
So I found it actually easier to try to just go with that a little bit and like um, and be be um, pay attention to not actually saying no or like conveying the idea that I'm on the other side. And how did it work out for you? Trying to work yeah. better. It did. And do you have your hand up also? Did you have your hand up? Tell me. Um, I have at Wellesley been working um, with Renew Wellesley on um, getting Wellesley campus to transition to um, alternative energy, um, which has not always been an extremely popular idea um, just because of the economics of it. Um, and so, but I agree with Nina that sometimes kind of listening and figuring out how to not directly disagree has been very helpful. That is one of the hardest things and lessons that I've had to learn, which is how and when do you fight and when do you sit back and let it slide a little bit to, until you get to a place where you're able to impact. Um, those lessons and, and navigation uh, are really critical as we think about our own leadership skills. Because I know how I felt when I was at Smith. I was student body president. I was really active. I was like, it's all about what I want to get done. How do you build coalitions? Let's go for it. Let's do it. And it's move, 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 move. Guess what? In the real world, it doesn't work like that, guys. It just doesn't. It is much more complicated because you need to know when, when to step back when not to be able to force a decision if it's not in the right time. And in this issue of, of extremism that, that I've just spent the last 20 minutes talking about, it's really important for you to think about um, what the mindset was in our foreign policy team around this. Everybody wanted to stop radicalization from happening. Obviously, we, we didn't want to see Al Qaeda build a brand new army of new recruits. Um, but um, this issue of immediacy of what needed to happen so that the American public and the, and the global public actually believed that we were doing something meant that planes flying with troops, bombs going off, all those kinds of things were much more tactile. You can really see a response there. How do you say we're spending money on soft power programs and we're really kind of trying to see whether or not somebody gets radicalized? It's, it's harder to sell. Something really unique happened to me um, in the Bush administration. And I was working at the National Security Council, and they were asking these hard questions around um, stopping radicalization and how do we lift up the voices. We all, all uh, we obviously understood that the U.S. government couldn't be the <laughs> couldn't be the source to tell a young Muslim kid how to think about their identity. I mean, let's get real, right? I mean, we 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 understood that, but we also understood that. Um, we could be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with really amazing ideas on the ground if we did it in the right way, but how? How do we do this? I had two amazing men who were at the, uh, the National Security Council who took the time to listen to what it is that we were trying to do. And they back-ended it, meaning we knew where we wanted to end up. We knew where we wanted to end up. We wanted to end up with the U.S. government's put, putting some money and time and energy behind soft power. We wanted to see some efforts out there in which we were able to lift up and bolster credible voices who were able to help Muslim youth step away from this idea of what Al-Qaeda was proposing. And, um, and what we ended up doing is we had a series of brainstorming uh, blue sky meetings in which we thought, what is possible? What's the thing that we could actually get done? And we thought, well, maybe if we got a lot of you know, entrepreneurs or we got a lot of um, you know, bloggers or we got a lot of, we started thinking about these networks that could be built um, that would actually influence young people. And we began to think, well, how do, we, how do we use our embassies to be able to find those people? How do we, be, so we began, we began, began this process of, of, of thinking more creatively. And there were, th these two men um, said to me, um, Farah, if you were to go into the communities and talk to Muslim young people and hear from them what their ideas are, do you think you'd find some really good ideas that we could actually, I don't know, support? And the answer was obviously, of course. We're going to go in and we're going to try to do that. And we spent two years going all around Europe. We, we pilot tested in Europe. 
And we talk to young kids in Germany, in Sicily, in Norway, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, who happen to be Muslim, first generation, fourth generation, didn't matter. Some were of Algerian descent, some were of Turkish descent, some were of Indian descent, whatever, all over. And guess what we found out? They had really amazing ideas on how to stop the bad guys from getting into their communities. And what we didn't even begin to think about was the power of their ingenuity. Their soft power approaches were awesome. And they said, we hate US foreign policy. We can't stand what you're doing in Afghanistan and Iraq. But you know what? You're in our communities listening to us. You're saying to us, we care about what you have to say, and that has value. And what we began to do was to build a coalition of like-minded thinkers, of young people all over Europe, and build first-of-a-kind networks of inspired, amazing young people who said, we are going to push back against the ideology of the extremists, but we're going to do it our way. All, what, all we want you to do, US government, is to help us form. So we don't know the person in Oslo. You know the person in Oslo, as well as the person in you know, Brussels, as well as the person in Paris, as well as. And we began to build them together, and the US government built first-of-a-kind networks that European governments weren't even building. At the end of the Bush administration, we realized that that model of being the listener, going into communities, going into places where we didn't usually go, was extremely valuable. We weren't telling them what to believe. We didn't care if they loved America, but we cared about their ideas to push back against the bad guys who were coming in, trying to, trying to lure in their kids. And we realized that if we could scale that, it would be really great. Well, at the end of the Bush administration, we had only done this in Europe, and I was on my way out. I, had, I was a political appointee in the Bush administration, and I was leaving, and this new president had just been elected, and he came into the White House, uh, and he had appointed this amazing woman to be Secretary of State. And uh, she was in the State Department, and Hillary Clinton decided that she was going to have, in the first two weeks, a bunch of over, like high-level meetings with regional bureaus to ask them, what are the big issues that are going on? And I was in the Europe Bureau at that time. And Hillary Clinton um, said, we, I only have an hour. I want to do high-level stuff. And my boss, uh, a guy, I'm saying this again. I'm going to come back to all of this in a second. Um, Dan Freed, Ambassador Dan Freed, who was, had been at the White House, he was now working for Condi Rice and had stayed for Hillary Clinton, Foreign Service officer, said to me, hey, Farah, why don't you come to this meeting? I want all the problem kids to come, meaning my, my subject matter was problematic. And I said, sure. And I'm thinking, first of all, I mean, Europe is really complex. There's a lot of stuff that's happening in Europe. And the Muslim, European Muslims in, in, in the year 2009, nobody was actually paying very much attention to like on the, on the international scale. Now everybody does, but believe me when I tell you, nobody cared at that time. And um, so we go to this meeting, and Hillary Clinton, um, I'd never met her before, uh, was sitting at her, at her private um, table. And of course, she's a superstar, so everybody in the world wanted to be at this meeting, and everybody's clamoring to be around this table. And she's really nice, and everybody's around her, and they're going through, and I knew we only had an hour. And I'm looking at my clock, and I'm looking at my clock, and I'm looking at my clock, and 45 minutes go by. And I was like, well, there's no way we're going to talk about Muslims in Europe. I mean, give me a break. Like, we're talking about NATO, the gas pipeline, Russia. Like, they're not going to talk about Muslims in Europe. At 45 minutes, Hillary Clinton stopped. And she said, you know, I'm going to have a chance to go really deep on a lot of these issues. But I want to make sure that everybody ca that came to the table today has a chance to speak. Hello, people. This is a really important lesson for you. Rocked my world. It rocked my world. I had never, ever seen anyone do this before. But uh, that, is, that is vintage Hillary Clinton, by the way. Seriously, she listens. She wants to understand, what do you have to offer? What, do you, what, why, what, 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 do you, what can you teach me? What, what dimension of this will you expose me to that I haven't seen before? So she stops the meeting at 45 minutes. She says this, and she points to me, and she says, why are you here? 
and I nearly died. And, um, <laughs> and the whole room is pin drop silence, I swear to God. And my heart is beating really hard. And I said, well, Madam Secretary, and I started telling her all the stuff I'm telling you guys about these networks of like-minded thinkers that we built in Europe, these awesome Muslim kids who wanted to fight against Al-Qaeda, but they, they needed the help to be able to do things. And I said, the European governments aren't doing this, and America needs to do this, and we need to, and so we're going back and forth. And one of the things I said to her, by the way, was the power of women. And I said, something, something, something. I went to Smith College, and she said, I went to Wellesley, high five. <laughs> so she do, I'm not joking, she does this. Everybody laughs at the table, and I was like, this is awesome, it's really powerful. Um, and it was great, it was lovely. She asked awesome questions. The more she questions she asks, the more her eyes get bigger, and she starts asking me things like, well, why aren't the Austrians doing this? And why aren't the Spaniards doing that? And why aren't the French asking this? And why aren't the Italians asking this? And why isn't NATO doing that? And, and, I'm, and I'm saying, America's doing this for the first time, and so she's asking <laughs> the right questions the right way. And everybody in the room is really kind of freaked out, I have to say, because they're just like, what, Muslims in Europe, what, why is Hillary, like, what is going on? Well, I was supposed to leave, right? And so my boss says, like, we're, we finished this thing, and my boss, Dan Freed, was sitting next to Hillary Clinton. And she, uh, and she, um, and he says, well, Madam Secretary, when Farah leaves, he's just starting that sentence, when Farah leaves, and she puts her hand on Dan's arm. She pushes him back. She leans forward and she goes, where are you going? <laughs> and I freaked out um, and I, I told her where I, where I was planning on going. And she just looked at me and she said, we will see about that. <laughs> now, I want to tell you in the context of this hellish environment we are in in America today, when everything is about, are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? When anybody believes that that's the only thing that matters, please remember the story, because it's not what matters. It is, doesn't matter if you're red or you're blue or you're purple or you're pink. What matters is your expertise. What matters is what you know. What matters is if you're a public servant, are you going to be able to deliver? Who cares if you're red, pink, blue, or pink, you know, striped? Who cares? And she didn't. And so when she said, we'll see about that, my first response was probably your response too right now, which is like, oh yeah, sure, right? <laughs> and I thought in my head, I'm not joking, was wait till she finds out that I work for H.W. Uh, um, Bush and George W. Bush, there's no way, there's no way she's gonna keep me. That, that, was, an, that was a little tape that was going in the back of my head, okay? I smiled, we all laughed, it's really great, whatever. We're walking out of the conference room and she's saying goodbye to everybody. And again, she said, you know, I'll, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. That's really, there's just no way, there's no way. And we walked down the hall and that's the end of that. And um, the very next day, the COO of the State Department called me. And um, Pat called me into his office and he said, Farah, uh, I understand that you're supposed to be leaving in two weeks, your, go good your goodbye party is happening, um, but I've been asked to ask you what it will take to have you stay. And my response to Pat was the response I give you today, which is when you are asked to serve your nation, you salute. Period. Period. I didn't know Hillary Clinton, but I, I just described to you what she was like in this meeting. Her leadership style. She wasn't asking me who did you serve, are you a political, are you a foreign service officer, are you a civil servant, are you military? She liked what I had to say, and she listened to what I had to say. And what ended up happening was that I asked them not to worry about the power of my title and all that crap, but to use my knowledge that I had worked really hard in the Bush administration to gather, to convince the people at the White House that soft power mattered, that we had to work on ideology, and that the Obama administration needed to scale everything that we, ma we, we learned. Because it wasn't about Bush and it wasn't about Obama that there were a billion Muslims under the age of 30 who were being targeted by groups like Al-Qaeda, and that we had to do something. And if we didn't do something, who would? And what Hillary Clinton did was set up an entire office based on that premise, that there was more that we could do to engage with Muslim kids, and that she gave me a runway that was open because she believed in what it is that I, I'm not some super genius. I had an amazing team Embassies were working really hard, but the Secretary of State understood the power of ingenuity, 
the power of taking risks, and here's the most important part, that you didn't always have to succeed. And she told me that. Try a bunch of things. Everything may not work, but try. Try this and try this and try this and try this. And that's the lesson I want to tell you right now. It isn't about perfection, guys. It is not about perfection. It is about using the best case scenario in your mind, the analytics that you have, to get to a place where you can make better decisions and to offer them. If you're always waiting for perfection, you will never get there. I was so lucky to be the special representative to Muslim communities. It was the best experience of my life. Not only because I, used to, I got to work for Hillary Clinton, who was a superstar and an amazing woman, and I learned so much from her, but because she experimented with what is possible. And what we were able to do in the Obama administration was to be able to build networks of like-minded thinker, like thinkers around the world. She said to me, take what you did in Europe, but do it around the world. And so we built these awesome networks of Muslims from countries all over the world. You heard the bio, I went to 100 countries, blah, 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 it was all great. But the most essential part is the power of soft power it was the ability to be able to figure out what a Malaysia needed, or what a Norway needed, or what a um, Argentina needed, or how to think differently. And importantly, one of the things that I really pushed very hard was you don't know where good ideas are going to come from. And she was able to listen to that in a new way. Because what we often do is to think the people with the loudest voices are the voices you have to hear. They aren't. So when I decided as special representative to, to go to Nigeria as the first country to visit as special representative, what did the State Department do? They all freaked out. Why are you not going to the Middle East? What signal are you sending by going to Africa as opposed to going to the Middle East when you're the special representative to Muslim communities? And do you know what I said? I said, are you kidding me? Do you know how ancient Islam is? Do you know how ancient it is in Africa? We never put Nigeria on the map. I'm going to Nigeria. And I went there first. I went to Kano. And I went to places that people didn't expect me to go. I went to Surabaya. I went to Guyana. I went to small Trinidad and Tobago. I went to places where the people are like, they're Muslims in Brazil? Yeah, there are, believe it or not. Amazing. Um, but it goes back to the thing I was saying to you earlier, understanding when you push and when you don't. And for me, some of these things were very important. One, not uh, judging people for what their political background was. Being clear to myself and to my team that ideas will come from places we couldn't even imagine. Big countries, small countries, small cities, villages, it doesn't matter, we have to listen. And we have to give grace to, to the ability to be, um, to be equal to everybody that we aren't having some sort of hierarchy of which countries are most important and which countries are not, which women are most important, which men are most important, I wanted to hear from everyone. And that universal sort of mindset helped me very much at the Department of State, not just because I worked, as you heard, for both Democrats and Republicans. It allowed me to gain credibility because I was able to say, I push aside all of the political stuff which happens in Washington, but to say, what's the thing we're all aiming for here, which is we don't want to surge in Al Qaeda. We don't want to surge in, in their ability to be able to t overtake things. So by focusing on the actual things that we're doing, building the kinds of programs that had a lot of agency and a lot of attention from, from folks, we were able to sell the idea of soft power, talk about the idea of ideology, and boy, oh boy, get, release some of the stuff that the US government doesn't usually do, which is to say, you're going to trust that guy in Dublin with a program on building you know, <coughs> capacity and resilience from a group like Al Qaeda? Really? And you're going to be able to say, yeah, I trust that 21-year-old guy who is a third generation Muslim from Pakistan who is Irish and is all about making sure that his peers don't get sucked into that horrible ideology. So in the course of the last 20 years, on the war uh, on terror or the post 9-11 era, however you guys are calling it, one of the things that has been most inspiring for me has been the capacity to understand how powerful it can be when you build the kinds of coalitions across places that you would never have imagined. And for me personally, 
as somebody who um, who has worked with teams that are Republican, hardcore, who don't all look. Whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican or you're independent, I don't care. No matter who you believe will be the best leader of the free world or not, you will never 100% agree with that person on every single policy that they make. So let's use two presidents that I happen to work for. One is President Obama and one is President Bush. I didn't 100% agree with every single thing either one of them did. But what I did believe was that for me, the person that I was working for believed in universal values that I could stand by. I never felt discriminated as a Muslim in the White House or at the Department of State. I never felt that there was any hierarchy of Christians over Muslims, over Hindus, over Buddhists, over anybody else. I believed in what we as Americans believe, which is that everybody is equal. Now, I'm sounding like Pollyanna. You might be like, yeah, whatever. But it's important for me because I could not go into a community in Kano, Nigeria, or Kuala Lumpur, or New Delhi, or to, you know, Dushanbe, and talk about my country if I didn't believe that the person who was running it actually did not have a hierarchy in, in, their, in their head. I didn't always agree in every policy, but I did believe that we were trying to do what we could do to stop the bad guys from recruiting Muslim youth towards their armies. And it has been an incredible ride for me to be able to take part in the kinds of innovative programs that, that young people have built. This isn't about the US government. This is about young people of the world, the millennials and now Generation Z, who are responsible <coughs> for making sure that they have the kind of resilience to fight hate. And that's where I want to end with you guys. I talked about extremism. Al Qaeda sounds scary. The so-called Islamic State sounds scary. But let me just tell you, the commonality of the ideology of us versus them is not just about terrorist organization groups that use that ideology. It is also the ideology of hate that you're seeing all around the world, and we have been lazy on hate. We have been lazy on hate, and we see it every single day. And what I want to say to all of you, the next generation of leaders, is you cannot sit back you cannot sit back and wait for somebody else to do something about any of this stuff that I've been talking about. It doesn't matter if you're Muslim or you're not Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're pink, blue, black, white, polka dotted, or striped. When you look at an ideology of us versus them, you need to understand that it is such poison. It is affecting all of us every day in many different kinds of ways. And what I want to see is I want to see the next generation of women coming out of Wellesley and Smith and all these amazing schools understand that your responsibility as citizens of this planet are not just about becoming the Hillary Clinton and Madeleine Albrights. I hope you guys want, if you want to be good, but it's your own agency in understanding, seeing what is happening around you and that the toxic hate-filled environment that we are experiencing as, as humans on this planet is rising. It's getting worse. I wrote this book, How We Win. It took me three years to write it. And I wrote it because I believe solutions are available and affordable right now. And it isn't just about the US government doing something. It's about what a regular citizen can do. I talk about this guy named Lukman Ali in Luton, UK who has a theater company. It's a street theater company. And you might say to me, Farah, big deal, street theater. Like, what's that going to do? You know what? Street theater works for those young kids in Luton, UK. And he sends messages to them about um, building resilience and about inclusion and diversity. The bad guys want you to believe in a monolith. Diversity is our friend. you got to go in the other direction. The book talks about. Um, stories of women and men, young boys and girls around the world who are doing really small and really big things together. And when I think about the power of all of that, I think about the importance as scholars um, to understand that you don't have to think about the biggest thing that can happen. You have to think about the nano interventions one on one. Imagine what it feels like. We've all had this experience. When you've been at a Starbucks or something, you're in line, and something just gross happens, like somebody says something annoying to you or they push you or they say something and you just it's, it just sets you off for the day in a really bad way. That tiny little thing, that little brush, that little hit, that little guy who 
cuts in front of you, or I mean, it, it sets you off. It, it changes your mood. You think about that teeny tiny little paper cut, basically, that you're getting, and how that affects you. And what and what I want you to think about is the impact of 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 that. And if you were to turn it to something good, the impact of saying hello, how are you? Good morning. Somebody who's having a bad day, who is different than you. I sound like Pollyanna, but I am telling you. When I look at where we are today in this world and the next generation of leaders, it is going to be essential that you look at mega interventions and you look at nano interventions. You look at hard power and you look at soft power. And you understand the importance of understanding what I've talked about in terms of diplomacy. How do you navigate these things when you want to get to a result and you don't actually always know how to get there uh, how do you build the coalitions to be able to do what it is you want to do? These are the questions that we, I ask myself today. They're the questions I hope you guys will be asking as you, as you go through some of these, some of these hard twists and turns um, in, your, in your careers. But what I would like to do is I, we have some time for Q&A, and I really think that's going to be more fun. So let's, let's pause right here.